let's reflect on what worked and what didn't work and what challenges you all had and um, what your experience was like. Would anyone like to share? And we should probably get the mic. Uh, Megha, if it's possible. Yeah, anybody like to share your experience? Either interviewee, interviewer, as a team that was planning what happened when you started. Um, yeah, one second, Mike's coming. I thought it was really interesting how, uh, although we didn't ask specifically to get to the core value, we really understood uh, based on the questions, we had an excellent interviewer and an excellent interviewee. Awesome. And uh, the family was very, very important. You could tell from the, the answers that were given. And, and it's, it, I never really thought that interesting. You, you can do that without explicitly yeah. getting to what what the real yeah, issue I is. Yeah. I love that comment because it, it, so in the next section we're going to be talking a little bit about listening techniques. Um, Indy Young, she wrote Practical Empathy. I talked about that in the presentation. It's amazing when you don't necessarily have like an interview type of approach, what stuff comes up. And if you don't have like a hardcore agenda, you'll actually learn a lot more about those values and those principles and those reasonings that people have. So that's a really awesome insight. I appreciate that. As far as the uh, planning was concerned, it was pretty okay in terms of uh, just putting down points. Yeah. But when it actually came to the interview, uh, because there was no pattern in the, the travel the person who traveled, because he also liked, he once traveled alone and once traveled along with the entire family. So the experiences differed in planning, yeah. in the purpose. So th there were different layers in, in, uh, in terms of the same traveler yes. who has traveled two different, uh, what to say, in, in modes, in terms of experiences. That's wonderful. So, so the planning also differed. Yeah, so so one was an impromptu thing which he didn't care how we traveled. And uh, in a case of with family, it was a long list of uh, to-do list structure in terms of arriving at the destination yep. and the way to travel. So you found so a difference in context based on yeah, what people yeah. are trying to accomplish. Yeah. yeah, values change based on the context of use. So that's extremely important to get. And you often won't get that if you just ask somebody what's important. So how about problems? Anybody want to talk about problems that they had or challenges they encountered? And if you can, if you're at a table that's still doing the interview, please stop. Um, just to make it easier for us to hear, and also I'm starting to lose my voice. And I can't hear with background noise. I need my bell. Yeah, can we, uh, folks, can we just, yeah, let's start focusing on the conversation now. Sorry, I love that you're like involved and animated. The goal here, though, is to activate you to these concepts, not to continue to solve the problems that I've given you. Um, so I want to hear what are the problems people had, either in planning, in execution, or asked, after you started asking questions? What was that experience like? Uh, I feel we got quite a mix of questions, like problems we got from people. So one of the main important points was communication gap between the travel agent and the person. They were expecting few information beforehand, but a lot of times they got the surprises in the last moment that somehow this didn't work out and the prices went very high. Why didn't you, you tell me before? So those kind of issues which you normally think is already sorted. Those came in the very last moment, so that affects the whole plan, mm. your budget, your mm -hmm. pocket, everything. So I think that is the one major factor people went through. I think that's the major communication gap is the main thing. Yeah, communication gaps and little gotchas, little like complete reversals that happen as a result of the questioning experience really can lead to new insights, but also problems as the interviewer. Yeah, yeah thank you. Any other problems? Up, up here. I'm going to slowly make my way to the front too, just so I can get back to the slides. So, um, sorry. Our, uh, what we had to do was figure out what people, we wanted to keep the uh, research really broad and not really go into the, you know, uh, interviewing people, deciding what we want to find. Mm. But then, you know, multiple things, right? So when we started, we had like a really lengthy discussion about how uh, our ideas about what kind of questions uh, classify as broad and narrow. Yeah. We, I think the 80% uh, of the time was trying, <laughs> us trying to decide what, that, what those questions would be. But then we kind of reached a common ground. And he was the interviewee, I'm the interviewer. And while asking questions, like we wanted to keep it broad, so the first thing was, what does this person feel about travel? Yes. And the second question was, uh, what do you, um, can you think of a 
tell us about a time when you thought, we, when travel was some, um, gave uh, you, you walked away uh, traveling and then remembering something, mm. something that mm -hmm. stuck with you. Yeah. It can be good or bad. So while having the discussion, I, I knew, I made a mental note that I'm not going to lead this person into thinking that was a good or bad because they're immediately going to go there, right? Yeah, but what I did, while I practiced it, while I was, and I do this also for my job, but then while I, when, I was, when I started interviewing him, you're also an emotional person at the end of the day. So depending on how that person reacted, I felt like I needed to guide him a little bit. So I'm like making those calculations in my head. At the same time, I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't have said good or bad because <laughs> now I've directed him. So this, again, with, in, in my experience using, I mean, I do a lot of interviews for design research. And this is something that you just have to keep doing it to get better at it. Yeah, it's, it, I really appreciate that point. And it, so starting at the beginning, you were mentioning that it's very challenging when you're trying to go broad because for us, especially in, in the world of UX or any kind of product design or any kind of engineering environment, you want to get at specifics fast, right? Because like, that's how you solve problems. But this isn't about specifics. It's kind of like the very first comment that we had from, from, from the table here. There's a lot that will just come out of the conversation if you trust the process. And it's tough because the interviewer and the interviewee, you're both on edge. You both have emotions. Those, you know, the interviewee, it's terrifying to be the interviewee because you don't want to give a wrong answer because you have a feeling like, oh, they're looking for something specific. I now need to find out what that is. It's really a, a co-discovery experience. And as an interviewer, you need to get the right answer, right? You're, you're a journalist. You're finding the story. But just trust the process. It will come. And I love the, the, the idea that if you start with something broad, like, um, you know, tell me about a trip that you took and some of your memories of that trip or some of your impressions of that trip. That's really a wonderful open question. But as soon as a person, I can see myself doing that, as soon as the person starts going down a path where I'm like, oh yeah, this is a pain point. Yeah, okay, I'm going to start nodding more and giving more affirmation. That's just going to lead to more of the feedback that's exactly like that. So you need to kind of almost go into um, observational mode. And it's like, Oh, okay, that's interesting. Oh, please say more. Um, you know, nod your head periodically, but don't do it so that you're like specifically drawing out specific points. And that's so hard. So at the end of the day, all of these techniques and the fact that you've spent some time practicing creating laddering questions and critical incident questions, you can now use these anytime. If you take Uber or Ola, or if you're at a you know cafe coffee day talking with the the, the cashier, the barista. You can, you can whip out a critical incident question. It's not a big deal. You can do some laddering. You know, the, the, the driver says, oh, yeah, well, I'm only doing this because of blah. Like, oh, why is blah important to you? Like, you can, you can bust out these techniques anytime so that it'll become part of your muscle memory and it'll feel more comfortable when you're doing it in a, quote, research setting. Uh, but then, you know, you don't need to, we need to get out of that, like as interviewers, get out of that mindset where, you know, we're formalizing that event. Yeah. And more of like, just like, I'm, well, I'm doing this, like I was telling these guys, when I walk home every day, they're sent vendors and whatever. And just go have a regular whatever conversation yeah. with them because sometimes it might not occur to you at that moment, but then later on when you think about things, we in our subconscious is making a lot of connections and it just pops out at another time. So this is a practice I've been doing and it's been kind of helping me map emotions. That's awesome. Like others in my own. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, you need to get out of the idea of solutioning and just into listening. And I think that's really, really hard for us. And so as much as you can practice, that's, that's ideal. So I know we had one more back here, yeah. Hi, I'm Swaraj. And thanks to Swatika, it was a very good interview from her. One thing I would like to share that while asking the questions, uh, there should be a balance. Like, okay, it's good that we are trying to know what uh, the interviewee is liking about the traveling, but what didn't work actually. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, nowadays we book our travels and they provide us the package. But sometimes it happens that people like, would like to do it on uh, their own. Like, as far as their budget, their time availability. but where we uh, personalize that experience for them. Like, if they are trying to plan it on their own, can we help them also from a, from a company or from an app side? 
so that's not happening current uh, currently and uh, that's what i i, I see that uh, the questions should be balanced between that what they likes and what didn't work basically basically then we can bridge the gap and fix the solution for them uh, sure. that will help more yeah absolutely and i think so you're it, it, and it sounds like you you've identified and highlighted some needs yeah. that are in the opportunity space but right. keeping in mind for this activity we're not really thinking about design. We're not really thinking about the opportunities. Right. We're really thinking more about what does that conversation look like? Right. And what are the values from that conversation? So right. um, I, think, I think understanding what's driving your user population to value yeah. will help you design when you finally do implement those new features, what's the right way to do it? Exactly. Yeah. So basically that will come up when we will ask that what didn't work during the travel, yeah. basically they uh, may uh, you know might have uh, you know planned something. But hang on, what, let me let me just let me get. It feels when you're saying what didn't work, you're already going into pain points, you're already going into solutioning. Stay up here and stay broad. Okay. We're not at the solutioning level right now. We're not saying how would you feel if I impl implemented a scheduling system in this app. No, definitely not. Because yeah. you want to be able to understand what do you value. Right. You know, family. I value family. Okay. We're thinking about implementing this new feature in our app. How could we tie that back to this family thing as a value? Right. Right. So don't be focusing so much on the pain. Okay. Focus on the value. Yeah, that's what we'll I get said. To the pain, it should be I, I balanced promise. between both. I think if it. Yeah, possible. but I would argue there's no balance here at all. We're doing value-focused interviewing. Okay. We're not doing pain point interviewing. Okay. That'll come in the next activity. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good observation. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do one more. Oh. Uh. uh so, sorry, I'm, I was raised with lines and cues, and so I'm going to just follow the cue. So uh, I am an interviewee. Oh, a little closer. I'm an interviewee. Yes, interviewee. And uh, then I was asked critical reasoning right? uh, questions. Critical first. reasoning question, yeah. And then uh, a I was asked I can't hear you. the uh, why questions. So what I thought that it would be better if we mix them. Hold the mic uncomfortably close to your mouth, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what I uh, found is that uh, if these questions could be mixed, both the techniques, yes. yeah. that could work better. Yeah, absolutely. So the reason why I had all of you planning both of these types of questions is because these questions come in concert. You never know when you're having a conversation, even an observation, where you realize, oh, I wonder why this is going on. I'm going to ask why. And then the answer should always be unsatisfying. So you need to ask why again. And then the person might say, well, you know, I really, I, it, it's really important for me to travel to see my mother because she's in fragile health. And actually, the last time I traveled, it was a real disaster. Oh, can you tell me more about that, that disaster as you mentioned it? Tell me about what happened. What did you do? How did you feel? What would you wish went differently? Like, you can swap the critical incident question and the why question all the time and get more valuable data that way, especially for things like needs and values and emotions. Yeah, it's a great observation. Yeah, all right, we'll do one more. Can we do one more from a different table? I'm sorry, I don't want to, I don't want to um, say no. I just want to make the volunteers walk around a lot. Hi. Uh, actually, my question is uh, some problem within. within. So uh, everyone talk. Uh, everyone likes to talk each other, and uh, you know the human fe feels you know uh, interacting with each other. So my question is, uh, is a little different. So we have a, a tool, a survey tool. So how can we get more out of it, uh, you know, ah. the questioning the users, because we have millions of users. Yeah. And uh, so how we uh, means question, uh, you know, in a human way, uh, so that would be, uh, help us. So if I can paraphrase, it sounds like you, you have a survey tool and you're wondering how could you maybe implement activities like this yeah. in a tool like that? Yes. So this is, so critical incident question, oh, it says reflect, sorry. The critical incident questions are actually questions that I start almost every survey I do with. Um, the challenge there is data analysis, right? But it's extremely beneficial if you truly are trying to identify what kinds of problems or, or values your user population has. It's beneficial to have that grounding question. You know, before we start the survey, Please, in two sentences or, or less, talk about the last time you had to blah. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, there's no good, I've found no good text analysis software, so you still have to eyeball it. Correct. But the cool thing is that A, it helps you identify, is this a real person that's part of my target? 
And then B, what kinds of things are they talking about? You will learn so much there. And it takes a lot less time to analyze even hundreds of responses than it does to do 10 interviews. interviews. Yeah. So you can do a critical incident question really easily. The laddering questions are much harder in yep. a survey because yeah. they all are contextual, right? Yeah. Yes. And so I don't, I don't have a good solution for that. All I can say is that every survey that I give typically closes mm -hmm. with a why type of question and an opportunity for additional feedback and information. You know, any questions you wish the survey asked but didn't. You know, again, there's going to be text analysis associated with that, but if you care about these things that are driving your user population, it's worth that amount of time. I would not plan a survey with 1,000 people yeah. with these open text, open-ended types of questions. But if you're doing a survey, let's say, with 40, 50, 60 people, totally doable yeah. using critical incident and maybe yeah. throwing in one or two whys. Yeah. 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 Good Thank question. You. Thank you. Thank you. It's, OK, I'd like to pause the questions here, because on, in terms of timing, we, have, we technically have three more ad activities to do, but I'm going to merge one of them, so we still have two. Mm -hmm. And so the way I see it, we have an hour and 20 minutes left. Is that ish correct? Correct-ish? OK. So I leave it up to you. Do you want to continue on, or do you want to do q and I'm happy doing both. I learn more through the Q&A, but I'm guessing some of you are going to complain because you want to hear more stuff and do more stuff. So let's take a show of hands. Continue the questions. Oh, OK, so yeah. <laughs> Please hold your questions. I'm happy to talk to you um, when we're done. And like I said, I'll be um, outside in the hallways at the booth and stuff like that for the remainder of the conference. So I'm here all day tomorrow. And my, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not doing anything tomorrow. So I'm totally fine hanging out in the halls and chatting. So hold your questions. Let's talk about them more. I, I, drew, I drew the app as a monster because I put stuff into it and that stuff disappears. Oh, OK, say more about that. You might want to bust out the why questions there. Um, or I drew, your, I, drew your product as, I drew this product as a superhero because it actually it literally saved my life um, last year. Please say more. These are extremely emotional stories if you can create the right context that you can um, elicit from folks. Because it's a time-consuming process, um, I have done this effectively online. You, know, you could do this using some kind of online uh, meeting tool. But it takes time, because you want your participant to take the time to draw, and you also want them to take the time to tell their story. And then you want the follow-up interview time. Um, works really well if you're doing like a group activity, a group workshop, participatory design, focus group. Um, but you want to make sure that the participants, the users who participate in this, are really representative of people that you're concerned about. You wouldn't cast a broad net. You'd want a really tight target. And so the advice is typically think about this in terms of extremes. So if you had, let's say you've got a, a user population using your product, you can say, if I had to break them into two different groups, what characteristics would define one group versus another? Oftentimes you'll find like novice users versus expert users. Um, for like this travel, it might be people traveling on a budget versus people traveling for business, or people traveling because they just got a ton of money and they want to you know, do, do a dream vacation. And you find people based on those extremes and have them tell their stories. Because it's really not a numbers game. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to collect data from you know, 25 people. It's fine to collect it from three. And the other thing is, because they are so time intense and, uh, intensive and emotional, they don't play that well in like a report deck. It's better to make sure that your key stakeholders are there witnessing and observing the experience. You could either do it the creepy psychology way with the one-way mirror, or they could be literally sitting in the room as part of the group. Or you could ideally take a video and then be able to play that back. So drawing and, um, uh, drawing and telling stories can be, can be very rich. So something to think about. Really easy, too. I love, the, I love these prompts, because you want the prompt to be disembodied enough that if you're in a situation where the participant knows you work for the company, you're talking about someone else, right? Tell me about someone else having a problem. Not you, of course, but someone else. Tell me about what, what this product would be like if it came to life. It gives a little bit of distance. It makes it a little bit more psychologically safe for the participant to speak their mind. Another technique, we talked about this earlier, is listening. And some of you did this during your, your laddering and your critical incident. Again, Indy Young, she wrote the book Practical Empathy. And um, she, out, she lays out the entire approach to doing this. It's an excellent book. It's totally worth it. Uh, however, if you're, on, if you're on a budget, 
just go to her website, and um, she actually makes most of her stuff available for free online. She's really, she's really great. But the idea of listening is, it's kind of like flipping the idea of a, an in interview on its head. What you're doing is you're trying to develop empathy and understanding the things that drive your users based on what they talk about. And a listening session is all about understanding why. What are people reasoning about? What are their reactions? What are their values and their guiding principles? And basically, you follow some interview practices in terms of you, know, you greet the person, you make them feel welcome, and that type of thing. But you don't necessarily have a prepared list of questions to answer specific things. You have broad questions where you're just trying to get a lay of the land. And so Indy talks about you know, have, your, have a question that's like a prompt, and it's like, let's start broad. And in many, many cases, it's probably analogous to what you all asked for your critical incident questions. Don't take notes. That one's hard, right? Because you don't want to have an interview type of idea going on in the mind of your participant. Let the speaker control the topics. The interviewee is the one who's driving here. If the interviewee goes in a different path, let it go. Take it. Follow that path and see where it goes. Because the path you want them to follow about your pain points, kind of like to the point I was trying to make um, earlier, that might be irrelevant compared to this other area that's so much more important to this user. And I hear your, your product team saying, yeah, but we're not building features for that. Well, maybe you should be thinking about it then, right? Won't it help to the listener? I'm if really I say... serious, uncomfortably close to your mouth. <laughs> I can't hear you. OK, what I'm saying is that if someone mentioned about their personal experience by telling, I also did that, won't it help in the person connect with the person so that they can say more things? <laughs> so if a person says something like, oh, yeah, me too, I did that, won't that help build a connection? Sure, it'll help build a connection. Your goal isn't to become this person's friend. Right. Your I goal agree. is to have a listening session where this person's driving. As soon as you say me, you make it not about them. Agreed. So do not do that. But nope. maybe some things they nope, might, nope, might nope, not nope, be comfortable. You're not going to change my mind. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question, and it's why a listening session is so hard. It's not about you. It's not about you building a good rapport with your participant. It's about the participant having a spotlight on them and them talking to you like they have a diary and they're sharing their secrets to their diary. As soon as you remind them that you're a different person, Oh, they might close off and shut, shut down. Sure, they'll be your buddy and they'll go grab a you know, coffee later. That's not your goal, though. Your goal is to get to their most innermost thoughts on values, needs, and emotions. So keep that in mind. I know it's a tough message, but it, it, it has to break us out of that interviewing mindset. It's a great question. So fewest words possible, right? Again, avoid I statements. We're trying to make this all about them. Ideally, we want our participant to just go on a monologue for one hour. Just talking, talking, talking about their thoughts and their values and their emotions. We're not even there. We'll do a tiny bit of steering, but it's really tiny. So if you can say it in, in, in very few words, that's good. Again, you have to practice that. How would I ask a follow-up question to this? And in, in I, I like to say fewer than five words. You know, five words if you must, but fewer is better. You don't really want to remind them that they're there. They already know you're there. They can see you. When Indy Young talks about doing listening, she talks about it actually being easier to do this remote because you don't have to worry about all the body language stuff. You don't have to worry about, you can kind of put your phone on mute while the other person's talking so they can't hear you cough or take a sigh, because they might read it a certain way. Again, it's all about getting to that inner monologue. And then finally, be respectful. So just like in any interview, don't judge. But if a person says something truly shocking, you might not be judging, you might, you might oh, right? Like you might have that surprise face or that, oh, that breath. That just reminded that person that you're there. So I bring listening up. I don't necessarily recommend trying it during our, our next activity, but you're, you're welcome to if you wish. But listening is um, incredibly hard because research, as researchers, and also just as people who consume media, right? we see interviews. There's a script for how an interview should work. You're the interviewer. I'm the interviewee. You're going to do this. I'm going to do that. Listening is totally different. It's kind of like being a friend but not being a friend, which is why it's so hard, right? So listening is a really great technique to try out. Yeah, can we um, we'll take some questions? Wait for the mic. <laughs> Maybe I'll merge the last two activities into one activity. So reaction cards. For those of you who consider yourselves interviewers and researchers, this will make you feel really happy. 
We're, we're outside of that uncomfortableness of listening. Reaction cards are, on the face, a really simple technique. And they're, they're in, uh, developed by a, a, a few researchers over at Microsoft. And the idea is after an individual has an experience with a product or service, you want to assess what values they, they would associate that product or service with. And so what they do is, let's say, it's, it's like a usability study. They could even do a usability study. Do a bunch of tasks with your product. And then say, I want you to go through these cards. And for each card, I want you to put it aside if, if it resonates with your experience and discard it if it doesn't. These are the cards. These are the words that are on each card. You look at these one at a time. It's a slow process, but it's very valuable. And this is available on Nielsen Norman Group. They've got this list. So for example, the person's just going through each card one at a time, like you know, confusing, dated, difficult, disconnected. And in general, they're kind of discarding most of the cards. But the ones they put aside are interesting. And then once they have this pile of, of cards, you ask them, pick your top three. So maybe they'll have 15 or 20 cards. Excuse me. Then say, pick your top three and stack rank them. So you have a number one, a number two, and a number three. And then tell me your thoughts and your reasoning behind that. It's a really great way, not, great way not only to get a good story, but also to understand if you had like values that you want your product team to follow, you either A, have a set of ideal values that are identified by your participant. Your participant said, oh, if I was using this app, I would like it to work this way. These three things. I want it to be fun, I want it to be controllable, and I want it to be sophisticated, let's say. And to me, these things mean the following. You could adopt those as team values. Fun, I forgot what I said before. Uh, you know, whatever those three things are, those are our team values. Every design decision we make goes through the lens of those three things. And then you say, here's the actual product, or here's a prototype, or even here's a scenario that describes how the product works. I want you to go through these cards and, and pick the ones aside that match the experience you just had. And if that, those cards don't match the values your ideal values um, are set to be, you've got a gap, you have a delta. Now you have some work to do. So it's great not only for assessing current values, but also ideal values. So reaction cards, and they're very easy, again, to, um, to manage. You present a scenario, you present a task, have the participant review the terms one at a time, select all that apply, prioritize the top three, stack rank, and then describe their rationale. It's not a card sort, right? A card sort would be Create a bunch of categories. No, that's not what these are. We already created the categories, positive and negative. They just need to pull them out. So don't confuse this with a card sort. However, if you have access to card sorting software, you can do this with that software. You can have cards with all these terms and just say, drag all the cards that match your experience to the match bin and drag all the others into the trash. And then from the match bin, now drag cards to top one, top two, and top three. So you can use a card sorting tool to do that. And many of those tools are available online for free. So card sorting, I'm sorry, reaction cards are a really, really robust approach to get at values. What you're not getting is you're not getting that rich story. You're not getting an understanding of that whole participant. It's not a listening session. It's barely a critical incident session. But it's very targeted, right? So if you're somewhere down the design path already, or if you're just beginning and you want to understand what values should we be striving for, reaction card methodology works really well. So any questions about that? So you would do this with one user. The, the user needs to go through all of the cards. OK. Ah, yeah, please. So uh, then a uh, user will pick up any one of the card, and then he or she will talk about the? They go through all the cards, and each one that matches their experience goes into one group. Each one that doesn't gets discarded. Then they take the top three, and they tell you a story about why. OK, OK. Got it. Yeah, you. you don't want them to tell you why for each card they pick out. That could take forever. Yeah. They're going through 120 cards. Right. And so if I have 30 cards that, yeah, yeah, it was kind of fun. Yeah, I really, I, I, liked, I liked how this happened when I did a thing. And yeah, it was, it was kind of friendly. It's, okay, it's like, I get it. Um, there's a story behind every card. You really want the story about those top three. Okay. Yeah, because you just don't have time. Sure, thank you.
Hi. So since we're kind of arriving back to top three emotions that they're feeling, right? Uh, how is it any different from going to them and asking, hey, when you think of our product, just name three things, three emotions that come to your mind first. Yeah. So how is this exercise different from that? Yeah, how, I mean, how is it different? I, I kind of turn that back. Like, what, what happens here that's not happening when you ask somebody to, you know, tell me the top three emotions that come to mind. They're going through painstakingly every single emotion they could possibly go through, and then they're choosing versus... Yeah, it's a recognition versus a recall activity, right? So when I say top of mind, what are the top three? Yeah, you have three things that are immediately available, but they might not be representative of how you feel overall. It's just how I feel literally right now. If I was, let's pretend I was 30 minutes late to this workshop, right? And, I, and I'm running here, and I'm sweating, and I'm breathing. And you say, oh, Steve, what, give me the top three emotions that come from the alarm clock app that clearly didn't work. I'll have three very strong emotions about that. But they not, might not be representative of my overall experience with that clock. It's a deliberate process. And instead of forcing me to recall top of mind, I can now just recognize terms that resonate. So it's more deliberative. Yep. That doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with simply asking a person. That's great data to get, too. But that's highly contextual. This is more generalized. Yeah, it's a great question. So let me continue on. Um, all right, I need your vote. This is a choose your own adventure here. So we have two more activities. We definitely don't have time for them. Um, and, and this is why I keep going back to UX India. I love the dialogue and the discourse that we have here. Um, but that means all of these great plans that I had just aren't going to happen. Um, same thing happens when I teach, too. So would you rather, by show of hands, go merge the next two activities, or do you want to do this one and then probably forfeit the one after? So the question is, so merge two, which means I'm going to talk about slides a little bit more. So that's the vote right now. So keep going on the slides, and we'll do one big activity at the end. Or, okay, and yeah, I know. I mean, you can, but that's kind of voting for the former, isn't it? <laughs> well, okay, like most hands just went up, so I'll just show you the other stuff that we're going to talk about, and then you all can decide how we'll, how we'll manage it. Um, the activity we're going to do is the travel app company wants you to identify the values users have about their app. You would then have somebody use an app, like literally use an app. Ola, calendar, um, flight search, whatever. And then they would either go through reaction cards, or you could do a listening session, or you could have them draw something to talk about the values they associate with it. Okay? We can totally do that in the next activity, too. We can just include this as a set. The only thing is I won't have my cheat words up here. So I'll need to do a little, or, or you could just you could download the slides from SlideShare. So let me go through, won't reflect. Let's talk about survey, because this is the most robust area in terms of stuff that's out there. It's also the easiest. The cool thing about surveys is they're super easy to deploy. So survey methods help you understand emotions. There's actually quite a bit of research that shows that survey data correlates well with emotion. Um, not all the time, not for all surveys, but in general, when you ask people to indicate their feelings, that seems to work better than a lot of other methods. You have to consider the granularity of the experience. Are you, un are you, are you worrying about how people feel about an interaction? Are you worried about how people feel about maybe your home page? Or how about how they feel about your entire app? Or how about the entire space that your organization is in, your company? You have to think about that granularity. The cool thing about a survey is, like during the presentation yesterday, if you decide, I want you know, a simple question to understand how emotions change over time, you could do like a one-question survey over time. Super easy. But if you want to know the complex constellation of emotions a person feels, that's really tedious if you're going to do it, let's say, every three minutes. Right? Your user will never complete the task. So the single item. Um, Self-report is, I would argue, probably the best bet for most of us in terms of capturing the emotions of our stakeholders. I'm oh, sorry, of our users. Uh, it helps you understand the valence. So how do you feel, positive and negative? And many versions also help you understand the intensity. So how much emotion are you feeling? You can use it uh, repeatedly. It's really simple. 
And in general, the simplest versions of these basically literally say, how are you feeling? And it's, there's nine point scale that's out. I'll talk about that in a moment. But really, the scale doesn't matter too much. It's just the valence. Do you feel negative? Do you feel positive? Or do you feel somewhere in the between? And, and how intense do you feel? A little bit, a lot. And there's a, now a, an organization called UX Emotions. This was published in UXPA and I believe presented at CHI. I might be wrong about that latter part. But it looks kind of like this. Uh, I think they're in beta, and so I think it's available for anybody who wants to use it right now for free, I think. Um, but the idea is that they have, so this is a survey. It is a, it's one question, even though, though, though it looks like a lot of rows. You just put a box in one of the, a check in one of these boxes. So you're basically asking, do you feel super positive? Do you feel super negative? Do you feel somewhere in between? And then how much of that feeling do you feel? And so you might put a box, for example, you know, oh yeah, I, I liked that product. I'm satisfied. And I'm really satisfied. So I'll put it right here. But you could also say, eh, I'm a little bit satisfied. So maybe you'll put it way up at the top under the satisfied column. But it's just one check. OK, make sense? So it's a single item getting both valence as well as intensity. Great approach. You can administer it multiple times. The authors of this have done a lot of research on it. Uh, they found that it correlates really well with how people actually feel post hoc. So you have people do a, a, a thing. They check the survey. You bring them back like in a week, show them a video. And they're like, oh yeah, here's how I was feeling. And they're, they're really accurate about judging that. It seems, to be doing, it seems to do better than biometrics. They submitted the images of participants to a company that read the face. And they found that actually what the person marked was closer than what the machine guessed. Maybe the person was lying, but I don't have any reason to believe, to believe that. Um, there's another approach. Sorry, the formatting's a mess. Uh, I had to convert the, uh, the aspect ratio here. But it's basically you're just asking people opposites. So this is called the semantic differential. This specific approach is called the bipolar emotional response technique, or BERT, which is cute. Um, there's not an established set of antonyms. You pick what antonyms you want. The recommended guidance is up to seven. So you decide with your team, what emotions are we most concerned about? And then what antonym pairs would assess those emotions? So friendly, hostile, clear, confusing, surprising, predictable. And then the participant just puts a, a, a check to where they feel. And you get a, a more a multivariate understanding of where they feel. You could also just literally put you know, the set of emotions that are there. But I think this is a better approach because it's a little bit more well-rounded. The Geneva Emotion Wheel, this is, this is wild, right? Look at this thing. Um, I believe this is available for everyone to use under Creative Commons. Um, the Geneva Emotion Wheel uh, has had quite a bit of research around it and is great if you are looking at getting that multivariate picture of how people are feeling. It's probably not great for repeated administration, like at the beginning, the middle, and the end of a task in a study. It's just kind of too much to process. But if you feel that your participants, your users are going to have those compound emotions, you can get those components. So you don't have to put a box on all of these things. You just put a box that corresponds to the emotion you're feeling and the intensity. And so if I feel, let's say, half pleasure, I could put a, a check in that middle circle on the, the pleasure radial. But also I feel some fear, because I'm not sure what's going to happen. So I'll put a, a little check in that middle fear. And for this study, I use the product, so I'm super interested. So I'm going to put a check in the interested. And also, I am going to get paid $1,000. And I don't know what that converts to. Multiply that by like 70, right? And that's rupees. Um, so I feel a ton of joy, because I am going to go buy something amazing after this study. So that's how you use the Geneva Emotion Wheel. And all the others that don't apply, just leave them blank. And then if none of them apply, I've got a none option. And if something's not there, I can just write it in. So I can get a sense of how my, my participants are feeling. OK? And then what if you're worried about bias? What if you're worried about people not understanding words or interpreting the, the term you use wrong? You can use something like Picamood. Picamood uses only icons. And the icons show you. In fact, if you're worried about cultural bias, it can be like robot icons. So unless they're biased against robots, and then, then you've got a problem. Um, so, and, uh, things like Picamood have been shown to, to work really well cross-cultural. So you don't have to worry about translation. Um, 
And uh, they've been embedded in various products. I think it was originally developed for education purposes. So like getting assessment of children and how they feel. But I really love this approach because it doesn't tie you to a specific language. You don't have to worry about localization. So, so those are the surveys. Any questions about the surveys? So in the activity, I'm going to encourage you, if you want to practice survey, practice the single item self-report survey. How are you feeling right now? Bad? Good. <laughs> I think that's, that's a great one to practice. So no questions? Oh, you all are great. OK, cool. Facial expression observation. So all the caveats about biometrics still apply here. But if you're with a participant, like doing a usability study, you can see them on a web camera, you yourself can assess what emotion you think you're reading. It's not necessarily going to be as accurate in terms of what the algorithms are picking up, because the algorithms are tracking all those face points. And we as humans don't have the ability necessarily to capture that. Plus, you all um, talked about kind of that gut reaction you had when you saw something, and then kind of like the, the follow-up feelings. So it's a little less um, valid, but could still be enough in terms of getting a thermometer of how your participants feel. And so there's a site called scienceofpeople.com where actually the author, she trains you online, like not hardcore training, but just gives you some, some, some landmarks to look at. And they're indicated by the different facial areas here. Uh, totally check it out. Obviously, you don't have time in this workshop to do it. But if you're going to have face-to-face -face contact with your users, it's probably good to start reading, understand at least gross measures of, of emotion from a face. And then also. There's body language. Body language, I think, can be even more valuable. Because a lot of times in a, in a study, people have that, that neutral expression that was mentioned. I think, uh, Swatika, you mentioned it. Um, body language might be a little bit more revealing. And it's a great indicator of arousal. So there's this idea of status. And so if a person has low status, you can often detect it because they have a small posture. So if they're sitting at a desk, they might be hunched over. They might be fidgeting. They might be obviously distracted. Um, they're, they're basically checked out. And if you, it's interesting. I have my students do observations at a local uh, subway stop. And they watch people, like tourists, coming in trying to figure out how to use the ticketing system, where you put in money or a credit card. And it kind of spits out a ticket that you can use on the, on the train. And it's totally, you can totally see when people are completely like, dejected. You know, they come up to the system, and they're like, And like you could just kind of tell. There's like an emotional conversation happening with the ticketing system. And, and you don't need to understand how to read the language. It's just so robust. So as a gross measure, it's really helpful. On the, on the flip side, if a person is really big and you know, stable and powerful, maybe they're staring. They're looking right at you. Um, they have a gaze as opposed to fleeting around. That's an indicator of higher status. So they're, they're feeling empowered here. So it's an arousal indicator. It's not necessarily an emotion indicator. Maybe they feel empowered because they're angry, <laughs> right? But it is something to take note of. It's kind of a, a free thing that you can look for when you're doing your studies if you have access to a, a, a person or a video. So hmm. All right, again, another vote. So those are those techniques. So the Travel App Company wants to understand how users of their app feel as they use the app. OK, so remember, you still have, I apologize, I don't have this on the slide, but you still have listening. Um, you still have drawing. You still have reaction cards. I have a few set. Most of my reaction cards um, <laughs> were taken yesterday. To be fair, I told people they could take them, and they took me on, up on it. So I think I only have two full sets of reaction cards. And they're actually, it's a subset. It's a smaller group, because there's just way too many cards to do. Um, but if you're interested in, in a team doing reac reaction cards, we've got a few. Uh, otherwise, I want you to think about an app. Think about a task. Have a person do a task on an app. And then figure out a way to assess their emotions. Ideally, before, during, and after they do the task. So you get kind of like three points. So unfortunately, listening won't work too well during, but you could still have a listening session after. They experience it. But you're going to have to figure out, how do I craft my script to ask questions about the beginning of the task, the middle, and the end? And how do I do that without being an interviewer? That's really tough. Okay, So 
I would kind of recommend not doing a listening session for this. Um, so does, that, does it make sense? Does your charge make sense? Um, and there's enough time here to do more than one technique. I'd recommend tr everybody trying a survey and just see how a person feels at the beginning, the middle, and the end using a survey. And then think of one other technique. And drawing could be good. Uh, observation, sure, that comes for free, right? Because you all can see the person there. Same rules as before. Uh, pick a participant from your table. That's the interviewee from the last exercise. I mean, it doesn't have to be the same person, but that's what we call the interviewee. Um, have them perform the task and gather emotional data at the start, the middle, and the end. Again, there's the, the, some hints about survey and observation. Any questions? Oh, yeah, Megha, can you? Sorry, thank you. Hi. Um, I would say he was really good. Uh, he was really grumpy. So when you don't expect your user to be the way, you know, you would normally say that, think that they would give you the feedback and he was like, yeah, I don't use apps. I, I don't like <laughs> net. I, 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 you know, I make p other people do my work. I just don't want to do it. So and then we were awesome. like, okay. <laughs> so when that happens and, you know, it puts you in a spot where how would you make this user actually even try using the app because they themselves are so uh, putting that you know a screen in front of them saying I don't want to do this yeah so you know yeah, it, it you was tough with fun. A person <laughs> yeah who's just not in the mood or you know maybe they're just only for the, co the money right the, the compensation that they're gonna get um, the short answer is I don't know <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. you know the longer answer is it depends on context and it depends I mean they showed up so you had to kind of meet them part way. Yeah. Um, were you able to do the task? Uh, we were, but the whole point. Begrudgingly. Really, I want to say, you know what? You know, just just call your agent and do it <laughs> because <laughs> I just felt the agent was so much better. <laughs> All right, so you had such a good persona that yeah. it just it became really really hard. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, good. very cool. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. Anybody else? Observations, experiences. Um, hi. Um, so. Uh, we kind of took like a different approach with uh, the process. Um, so we asked our interviewee to think out aloud while using the app. Okay. Um, so that gave us more insight about how he felt rather than just uh, uh, after completing the task, we asked him how he felt before, while and after. But because of the think out aloud, we could have like a lot more insight about how he was feeling yeah. and where uh, his emotions changed. So it, it kind of uh, took like a path from feeling that uh, he's in a hurry to complete a task, which is going to be really easy. Yep. But then when he starts doing it and there is like a lot of information to process and choices to make, it becomes uh, a little problematic. Um, then he um, makes, he has to make the choices. So he um, gives himself the uh, uh, validation by reviews and photos then uh, eventually he's uh, satisfied with his choice, confirms the booking, and feels the satisfaction and relief eventually. Okay, do you, did you, for the emotions that you got, were they based on the verbal protocol, the thinking out loud, or was it also based on survey questions, looking at the face, looking at the body language? How did you assess that the emotions were um, the right ones? So thinking out loud goes along with uh, reading the uh, body language. Mm -hmm. So it so you took of advantage of some of the visual yeah. cues that were being given. Yeah. So uh, even if uh, while he's fidgeting with the up and down, so you know it's really hard to make the choice. Uh, so yeah. And fidgeting is a good example of low status too. So it kind of shows an arousal problem too. Yeah. Um, that, uh, but it would kind of uh, sometimes do uh, like a complementary scenario where the user says that he does not mind making any choice, but he's still fidgeting while taking the choices. Like yeah. He does not have any Right. Constraints. Yeah. Sometimes the body says something different than what the words are. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I, I love that example. If you're, you know, if you're just doing simple verbal protocols, right, think out loud, that can be extremely beneficial. It's just that the challenge is sometimes we don't say what we actually feel. So you have to make sure that there's ideally another stream of data so because we can see people and we kind of see their body language, we can see their faces, we can say, okay, he's saying that it's okay or it's a great usable, usability experience, but what I'm seeing is completely different than that. And so that might be an opportunity to kind of just make a note that's a, that basically says, user said things are okay, I did not observe that. You know, and, and that's a great conversation later for the team. So great opportunity, yeah, that's a great opportunity to capture that data. Thank you. 
So uh, I was into interview. Yeah, you were a grumpy person, right? Yeah, I'm yeah I, awesome. I was the grumpy person, and they were trying to um, interview me, and uh, <coughs> I deliberately uh, became more grumpy. Uh, but the thing, uh, the, the good thing for me was, as an interview, I learned a lot about um, when the things went wrong. I refused completely that I'm not going to listen to you guys. Then <laughs> I see, saw them changing their tracks. There initially they were just saying, why don't you do this and th do that. Then they changed their tracks and they offered me some, uh, you know, uh, midway point where I could meet them. So these were the things that I as a designer learned that, uh, uh, you know, yeah. you can't just bombard people. You have to offer something. Yep. It's, it's kind of a bargain and to and fro and give and take. Th that was, uh, for me, that was awesome. That's a great observation. Yeah, unfortunately, as researchers, when you're running a session, you're, you don't have the power position that I have here. You can't just barrel in and say, okay, you're done. Okay, let's talk. Okay, move. You have to go with the participant because you have to honor their time, you have to honor their commitment, and you have to honor the fact that they actually have valuable data for you to get if only you can figure out how to get it. Yeah, really great. Let's do, um, let's do one more question because I just want to show you the remaining slides and then make sure you all get lunch. So microphone, Lapa Mudra. No, the back is shy. It's, oh. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. Uh, so I figured out that uh, the persona of the person was very important. You asked him to be deliberately grumpy. Yeah. But I found out that if the person is like uh, is natural, he can be uh, like uh, act differently. Yeah. Like if, if I'm asking a person who hates my app to give me some uh, some kind of feedback, he'll give it differently. But if I'm asking someone like who just hates using other apps, he, he will uh, respond uh, differently. Good point. Yeah. yeah. So uh, just wanted yeah. to make a point. Context of use is really important, and context that the user is coming from is really important. Yeah. I think it's great. It's a great distinction. If they hate your app or your company, that's very different than hate using apps to do this task. And the, the level of data that you can get is very different, which kind of shows that like the critical incident and the laddering questions we had at the beginning can also help you kind of set the stage for what kind of user this is. So I think that's really valuable. So in the interest of time, let me just show you the other slides um, so you know what's here. I'm more than happy to you know, continue chatting with you all here at the conference and on, you know, online, socially, et cetera. Um, so the one piece that we're not you know, going to have time to do today is mapping. And that's, that's totally OK. Um, but mapping is, is this whole concept. I'm sure most of you have tried or, or, or dabbled in journey mapping. Raise your hand if you've done journey mapping. Yeah, so you're all pretty much at least familiar with journey mapping. If you haven't done journey mapping, or if you haven't done it and it worked well, think about ways to make it less complicated. When you look at this list of possible things that can go into a journey map, it's paralyzing. And when you think about it as a stakeholder, like if I'm a director of engineering, and I look at a journey map that has all, has all that, I might say, I don't even know where to look. So think about doing something really simple. Think about narrowing your focus. Just say, this is a journey map for this type of user in this very specific kind of context. We're only focusing on you know, the main phases of using our product. So like we did today, before, during, and after. That's a beginning journey map. And then over time, as you flesh the journey map out, it can turn into, well, before actually has like pre-awareness and then awareness. And then during is really like, onboarding, configuration, uh, production, etc. And so you can break it down over time. But you need to do it as part of a, a social process that involves all your stakeholders and a way that makes sure that the, the data you're capturing is actually meaningful. And for us today, that includes emotions. So when you're building journey maps, and this comes from a, um, a blog on Medium posted by one of my former coworkers at Salesforce. Her name is Richa Prajapati. She did a great project with, um, with some teammates to identify how do we tie emotional information to the journey. And she did some exploration of the different kinds of data you, you could collect. And she noticed that stakeholders reacted in different ways based on how the data were depicted. So if you have only qualitative data, you might want to only use qualitative indicators, such as like smiley or sad faces. Because if you use something that looks like a graph, people are going to look at it and say, oh, well, show me the data this is based on. It's like, oh, no, I, I only did 10 interviews. But that's not the point. The point is people in general, when they experience this part of the product, are super happy and here they're super grumpy. Um, if you're doing a mix, you can usually have some kind of graph with quotes right, that are embedded. And if you're doing something purely based on quant, 
like maybe usage data, you could just show those indicators. Or survey, if you have a survey indicator of 1 to 10, you can just show where that survey number is going. So think about how you could tie this to your journey map. And we're not going to practice mapping. Sorry. Um, we're not going to reflect. So my last, my last um, second to last slide is these are the resources I talked about yesterday. I strongly encourage you guys to check them out. Seductive interaction design is great for designers looking to create emotional experiences. Um, it's, it's one of the hallmark um, texts of its kind. It's, a, it's, it's an easy to consume book as well. Patrick Jordan wrote what I consider to be the Bible of research for emotions. He calls it Designing Pleasurable Products. Um, really excellent book that reviews all the different types of techniques. There are um, easily 100 techniques. So many of them are variations on the themes that we talked about today. But if you're really wanting to geek out about this, check that book out. Don Norman, of course, Emotional Design, Why We Love or Hate Everyday Things. It's kind of the, the, the seminal work on why designing for emotion matters, why emotion will often carry you th your users through the bad times, right? So check that out. And then finally, um, Aaron Walter's book, Designing for Emotion, is a really nice design guide in terms of principles and practices and techniques that you can consider when designing for emotions. That's a little bit more um, uh, practical, I would argue, than Anderson's seductive interaction design. The seductive interaction design is more about global um, strategic thoughts and, and concepts. All four of these books are awesome. I would strongly encourage you to check them out. Um, I leave you with this quote from Turkish designer um, O.M. Kobanli, Kobanli. Good design touches you. Great design touches your soul. Isn't that sweet? So as you think about the next design project that you're working on, ask yourself, how can we make sure that this is touching our users' souls? And how can I do research to prove that? OK? So I know people are taking pictures, so I'm going to leave this up here for a sec. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Please reach out to me. You can, uh, if you like watching what I eat and pictures of what I drink, go uh, follow me on Twitter. Um, all the slides are on SlideShare. And you can reach me at LinkedIn. Just send me a message. If you use LinkedIn Mobile, I've learned that it won't let you send a message. So then send me a direct message in Twitter saying, hey, I'm not a bot. Um, you know, that's who I am. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It was awesome. <laughs>